Well, I started off politically through my involvement, or my exposure out at San Francisco State during the strike. I, I got to San Francisco State at 96, the tail end of 1969, was very, right at the tail end of the SF State strike. And I was coming from basically, um, and I'm, I, came back, I come from a farm worker background. My parents are Mexican, born in Texas. They migrated to New Mexico. I was born in New Mexico. Some of us were born in New Mexico. Some of us were born in Texas. Some of us were born in California. There was 11 of us in the family. But my uncle had settled in Salinas. And then my dad followed him in 1952. And basically, we settled there. And I ended up growing up in the farm labor camps of Watsonville. Um, I went to like six different elementary schools because we kept moving from camp to camp to camp to camp. I loved it. I was a kid. Uh, we did nothing but run around with our friends. And so it wasn't hard for me as a, as a young child. I didn't, I knew we were poor, but I didn't really, it didn't really phase me, you know. It was just like, I was happy. We had a family. We always got fed. Everybody worked. That was, you know, that was it. That was it. I, I had no clue. It wasn't until probably late 60s that my family bought a little house in Las Lomas, just outside of Watsonville, and we settled there in a little community that's pretty crazy now, but you can't even drive in and out of there. There's so many cars and people we buy. So my mom's little house up on the hill is slowly falling apart, but at least she's got, she has something. Anyway, but that, that <coughs> orientation, when I came to San Francisco State and the strike was going on and there were all these social movements going on, it wasn't a real stretch for me to want to be connected to it, especially with the farm worker stuff because I knew it firsthand. I mean, we grew up in the farm labor camp. We grew up working and picking strawberries and apples and radishes and cucumbers blackberries, you name it, we did every, we did all that stuff during the summer. So it wasn't a stretch for me to, to go from there to there. In 73, in 1973, I went, um, I went to Cuba on the Vencedemos Brigade. And by this time, I had, I had already, you know, almost, I'm almost done with San Francisco State. I found, by accident, I found the art department at San Francisco State. I mean, literally, I walked into the art department. One day, and I just thought, "Oh shit, this is what I want to do." You know, I I didn't know how to draw, I didn't know how to do anything. All I knew is that I had a desire to want to do what other people were doing in there, and that I thought I could do that because everything else was alienating to me. But once I once I walked into the art department, it just felt right. And as a result of the strike, as a result of the ethnic studies department the empowerment that we got as a result of what was going on there. And I took some ethnic studies classes, but I ended up getting a degree in painting and drawing. I, I came out, and I also met Rupert at San Francisco State. He was doing his, uh, some of his early posters there. And uh, it was because of the social movements that were going on and the need for political posters that I got involved in. So I started doing this kind of stuff, I mean, the, um, the Nicaraguan one I did for Roberto Vargas and some of the poets, and I've done, I did several posters. Um, I used to work in a print shop called Fitz Printing. It was a movement press on Valencia Street back in the 70s. That's where I kind of started to figure out how to, they taught me how to do free press work there. And as a result of that, I learned how to kind of lay out my own posters that could be printed offset on an offset lithography uh, press. So like everything there basically is all was all done offset. So it wasn't subscreen. Um, but I learned how to do it because I worked in a shop. And as a result of working in that shop, later on Rupert introduced me to a Garcia Litho. Garcia Litho was down on New Montgomery and Mission Street. There was like a mom's and pop's print shop that printed everything for all the Macy's and, and 
Emporium and all that kind of stuff. It was all commercial. But I learned how to do all the pre-press work there. And then eventually I got hired at La Raza Silkscreen Center when they decided that they wanted to check, go from silkscreen, but also they wanted to do offset. And they got this big press and they hired a guy from LA to come and run the press. And then they hired me to do the pre-press work because I knew how to do it by then. I had been working in the shop. I knew how to do all the camera work, all the stripping, all that kind of stuff. So I did that for a little, for a couple of years, and then it didn't work out with La Raza Silkscreen Center. So I left, and I got hired at the Mission Campus. They were looking for somebody because they have a printing program there. They used to have, and they ran offset presses there, and uh, they needed a free press person. So I taught free press with City College there. Uh, I did that for like ten years. Right? So it, it's just, it all came around, it, it's all kind of evolved, my work in the mission, working with Galeria de la Raza and Acción Latina, and basically I did a lot of, I also did a lot of silk screens, Dia, Dia de los Muertos pieces, an earlier piece, not that old, but basically it's, you know, something that I silk screened and I added it to it because the opening was for Dia de los Muertos was on the day that we opened, so I thought I'd have something for Dia de los Muertos. But basically, I pretty much for a long time, I was known as and recognized as a poster maker and silk screen. And I'm part of, now I can say that I'm part of the Chicano poster movement, because I was part of that thing. I actually did stuff for a lot of different organizations. Um, the South African Women's Day, I did for the Alliance Against Women's Oppression, and I got a chance to do several posters for them. I also did their poster, the World Women's Conference, the first one in Nairobi. I was able to do that one as well because my partner Michelle was part of the organization, so I had a connection to the organization and I was able to do some things for them. So that, those posters came out of that. Uh, it was, and I continued doing screen printing. I worked with Renee and Joss at Mission Grafica. I used to go and work on various projects with them. I did, I set up a little studio at my house where I could sew screen. But in 19, around 1997, I was teaching in the county jails. I was unemployed for a while before I got to the Mission Cultural Center and then I couldn't find a job. And Joss had just left the jail. He was teaching out at San Bruno. And so they, he asked me if I would go come over and take over the, the job there. So I did that, and I taught at San Bruno for like four years. It was between San Bruno, sometimes I would teach downtown at the Hall of Injustice on Bryan Street. There I worked with the women, and I also worked with the transgender community. Over at San Bruno, I worked there in the evenings, and I'd go and I'd work in a dorm, one of the dormitories that was in the recovery dorm for people like that. You know, going through recovery stuff and drug things and getting sent to prison and all that stuff. So I worked there for a while. And it was while I was at the jail that I basically decided that I wanted to propose this class in relief cutting, carving. You know, I had done it a little bit in school, but I really never, I didn't really catch with me. I liked it and I loved, I loved the medium, but it didn't take until I, did the one till, till I did the class at the county jail, and I carved this tiny little block of this woman holding this baby, and I used it as a demo for the for the class, and uh, I haven't stopped carving since then. I mean, I just went crazy with it. So, so in a way, it was I'm basically kind of like self-taught with the relief stuff because I didn't go to school for it, I didn't take any classes for it. It was just a desire because I already I already had the drawing. I loved to draw and take things and draw and work. So the carving kind of came natural. I don't have, well these are, these. this carving that you see here now, these are much more refined. If you see some of my early cuts, the cut is not the same. But as I, as I did it more, I learned what to cut and what not to cut. And there's areas where I, don't, I know I don't even need to cut because I can create, I can create a line without even having to, um, you know, like, like here, 
what I carved here, I saw. And I break linoleum off. And, well, I don't, I, when I first started, I used to make a line for all this stuff, and I realized I don't need to do that because what I saw, that creates a line, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just stuff that you learn as, you, as you're doing it, right? I ended up, so I ended up carving and doing all these, these prints, and I haven't, I haven't quite stopped. I ended up, uh, about three or four months ago, I did an artist residency at uh, Blue Mountain Center in New York, in upstate New York. I was there for a month. And before I left, I, w I was already thinking about, I wanted to do some things about the border and what was going on on the border. And uh, so what I did is I did a collaboration with um, this photographer named Francisco Dominguez. Some of you might know him. He has a radio program that he does every week, once a week. And he's out of UC Davis, or some of those But anyway, he's a longtime activist and photographer. So he loaned me some photographs. Um, and it was these two here, this man and this woman. This one came from another source. So I had those drawings, I had those photographs when I when I went there, and I also had the photograph of the man picking the apples or plums or something. Anyway, he, I like that piece because it was the angle, and I really foreshortened it. I, that's one of the things I learned from from Rupert, and I learned from the Cuban poster makers is how to kind of push everything like forward so that it comes right, so it looks like it's coming out at you. So anyway, that was the first piece that I did. What I'm, what I was, what I did is I, I basically, you know, I'm drawing it on to the linoleum, or I'm drawing it on paper, and then I'm transferring it, and then I'm just basically carving it out. And I'm, because there was no press there, I'm basically just I'm hand rubbing it on to Japanese tables, and then I went back and I watercolored. The watercolor I did once I came back here. I didn't do it there, but I watercolored it afterwards. And I've been doing other prints, basically. Um, with the water, with the uh, Japanese watercolor, with the Japanese paper. And then I colored some of them in, and some of them I just leave. Since I'm not doing that many additions, I mean, my addition, if I, if I get two or three out of one of these, I'll, I'll be happy. But the little girl, um, I did that one before I went to New York. Um, and that one, including the one over here with the crosses, and I'll explain that one a little bit in a minute, but her, I started drawing her before I went, and I thought, well, you know, it'd be nice to take something already drawn out that I can carve while I'm there, and so I started working on this little girl, and I drew her, and then I just kept, it kept changing, and then I changed all her clothing, and then all of a sudden I saw these birds coming out of the book, and so I added the birds, then I added the piece going behind the bird, and then I added the pieces in the back, the Mesoamerican pieces. So it's all, it just kind of evolved as I was doing it. I really didn't have an idea to do it that way, but that's what came out. And because I used a long block, I was going to cut the top of the block right where her head was. That's what it was originally going to be. But then once I added the birds and I, I had this movement going on, and I'm like, well, why did I use the whole block? Because it needs a background to it. So then I ended up doing that. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about before I went to New York, I had been thinking about <coughs> the Amazon and the things that were going on in the Amazon. So I did, I did the woman there in black and white, and I'm actually silk screening her now. Because I take, I take some of those and I go back and I re-edition them as a screen print. So I'm actually doing that one as a screen print. But I did that one before I left. The little girl I was supposed to do before I left, but I got so into carving her, I carved, I did her basically within the week before I left. And I carved it and everything and left it. So that I came back that minute. Because I was so into like getting it done, right? Um, but it kind of evolved. The, the one over here, it was basically, Francisco had loaned me these images, and I was thinking about the border, what was going on in the border, and I started by drawing this man. I just drew him right on the block, and then 
And basically on the cross it says no olvidada. So it basically says like, they're not forgotten, right? So I'm thinking, well, who is he talking about? Who is he? Who is he? Who are they, right? And then he has on the cross it had all these little like earrings. So I said, well, obviously it's maybe his wife, maybe it's one of his daughters. I don't know who it is, but it's somebody. So I drew him in, and then I drew her, and then I was going to have these crosses coming out of here, and I started drawing these crosses, and it just it just didn't work, and it didn't have enough tension. So I found this image, basically on the internet, of this woman holding this kid, and this kid is screaming. Right? These these are people that had been arrested on the border or had been or at the border, right? So I added them to that, and then basically I thought about all the different people that these this no olvidadas are. Basically, it's their the mother, the wife, the sister, the people that have been disappeared, the girlfriend, the tia. The, so I just started adding all the crosses and adding all the names to it. And then at the end, I added the words to it again. So, um, and that's kind of a reoccurring theme in my, in my work. But basically, it just kind of evolved. And I just kind of still kept drawing. I kept adding things to it. I kept drawing. Uh, I had started carving them out, and then I stopped, and then I drew her, and then I carved her out, and then I, so I kind of kept going until I got the whole thing done, and that's kind of like how it evolved, and the, the stop deforestation was, I was thinking about, again, I was thinking about the Amazon, and then I had found these images of these people, the Kayapo people from basically National <coughs> Geographic, and I pulled a bunch of them, and I had taken them with me. And I started drawing them on the block, and then I, it ended up being a poster. It didn't start out as a poster, but as I drew it, I drew it, and I carved these guys out, and then I realized I wanted to add the other ones to it, so then I added these guys, and I carved them out, but I didn't know what to do with the background, and as I realized that I wanted to, you know, announce who they were, then the poster came out, then I added the black, made this black, made this white, I made this contrast. <coughs> this was a lot of fun because there was a lot of detail in those. But didn't the fire start after you did this thing? Yeah, this was after I had. The fires were. They hadn't started yet, before. but. It's almost prophetic. Like there's a couple of people who yeah. have. I was already thinking about uh, the Amazon. It was already kind of in, on my mind. And then in last year, I went to um, I went with my cousin. She lives in she lives in Albuquerque, and I went to Chihuahua to see my cousins. And then I took portraits of them, and I took the pictures with me, and I drew them out when I was there. And I started carving them. I didn't get to finish it there, and the, and this middle piece was blank because it was supposed to be another guy here. But I left them out and I ended up putting Zima and Zima with Wallace on it. But it was basically my cousins that I saw. There's a lot of them. I just did some of the older folks and some of the younger people, but I ended up doing it like doing all my portraits. I hadn't <coughs> I hadn't been to Chihuahua in probably 10, 15 years because I used to go to I used to go to um to Juarez to El Paso because my cousins Mom's family was in the Paso, and then I'd cross over to Ciudad Juarez. And then I would take the Chihuahua the bus to go to to Chihuahua. But the border got really, really scary, and I was afraid to go because there was so much stuff going on there, and I didn't feel safe. Uh, so I stopped going. And it, had, it wasn't until I went this last year with my cousin, because she drives there from Albuquerque, and then I went with her. So that's what came out of that. And the black and white kind of checkerboard thing was something that came out after I started carving it. And it just made sense, you know, the black and white and all that. But anyway, that's kind of how, that's not how I'm working now. It's like I start with a little idea and I know exactly what it's going to be. And then it just kind of evolves. But the piece up on top, the one that's also about the border is, is a guy being arrested by the border patrol people. But then when I started drawing it, I was like, well, hell, this guy's a pig. 
you know, and I was thinking of the Emory Douglas and the old Black Panther Party stuff that he used to draw, and I always make the cops look like dicks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I drew him like that, and then I drew the Ku Klux Klan guy with a hood, and then I ended up, there's another, another piece that I did <coughs> a few years back, but I added, you know, a headdress to the man, so that, you know, he's basically being arrested by this. You know, the rest of this culture is not just the person that they're arresting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but that's part of a portfolio of prints that I'm part of an organization called Consejo Gráfico that are Latin American printmakers and we're studios. We're studios from different places in New York. Taller Boricua out of New York, uh, Studio Pepe out of New York, Self-Help Graphics out of Los Angeles. There's a couple of studios here. Malakios Montoya is part of it. There's a bunch of us. There's uh, Rene Arceo, Arceo Press out of Chicago. So we all get together, like every couple of years, we're getting together. In April, we're getting together in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. But there's a big print biennale that's happening there, and we're going to be a part of it. So, I get to go. so we do it. We did a portfolio of prints called um, Perro Mundo, Dog Roller, so, and that's the print that I did for it. But I silk screened it in color, and I actually sent the ones in color, but I don't like the way they came out. But that's what happened, and I like the black and white ones better. So I should have just done them all in black and white. But, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm.